What we have here is my G4 titanium PowerBook parts machine. Uh, this machine I recently found while doing the final cleanout uh, where I uh, where I'm employed, and um, it was the last remaining PowerPC notebook in the entire organization, the last one, and. Uh, it was saved by accident. Um, it was headed to the crusher many, many years ago, and it just didn't happen, thankfully. But this one is going to provide me with da -da -da, a new shift key. This laptop actually has some history to it. When I took my job back in, uh, when I was hired, I should say, back in... Uh, in summer of 2006, my uh, predecessor handed this to me on his last day and said, oh, here's your laptop, by the way. Good luck. This is the laptop, and it's still around. Um, I used this laptop begrudgingly for about, oh, I think I used it for three months. <laughs> and then I shoved it back in the closet because it was in terrible shape. Now this has most of the defects that you're going to find typically on a PowerBook G4 Titanium. And let me uh, get some alcohol out here. We're going to clean it up. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Um, this is actually the first generation of the G4. This is um, copyright. If you look at the bottom of the case, it's a G4 500 with a copyright date of 2000. So this is the first of the G4 line. But let me show you what I mean. Now on this screen, you can actually see, you can clearly see it now, but I'll get some light on this. You can see where, uh, it looks like the home row. Yeah, here we go. See all these little scratches in the polarizer? If I shine the light this way, it might show up. There we go. Look at all those marks. That is from the keyboard and the screen having a little bit of close togetherness time, a little too much. And that's what happens when the laptop is folded. Now look at this one right here, right down, right down the middle. So what happens is, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, screen is too close to the keyboard, especially when it's packed in a bag and transported. Now you couple that with the dust and dirt that lands on your keyboard through normal use. And that's what you get. Notice how I'm cleaning this keyboard with a rag and I'm not breaking the keycaps off. This comes after years of experience and years of practice. I've actually come up with my methods and I don't even do it consciously, I just do it. Um, but I'm able to get the job done without damaging anything. So this has, um, I would take the whole keyboard, but this one has a lot more wear than this one does. This one has almost no discernible wear on any of the heavily used keycaps. You want to look at your shift keys, well, eh, and your space bar, and your A's and your S's. The more commonly used keys are going to show shiny spots like this space bar. See that? So I'm able to thankfully do a side-by-side -side comparison. But this spacebar has been used heavily. This A and the S and the D return key looks pretty good. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to save this keyboard for spare keycaps, but obviously um, I want to be careful with that. I want to keep the keyboard that's on this one because it's in the best shape. Now, when pulling keys off of keyboards, it's important to pay attention to how the key is mounted. Um, the shift key is clipped on from the top, and it is slid into its carrier from the bottom. So that means we want to pull it off gently from the top, like so. There we go. It was just that easy. And we don't have any broken clips, so the key is salvageable. Then, we want to take this little bar, fold it out, oops, like so. I just pressed some buttons on my camera, don't know what I pressed, but uh, here we go. You want to fold the, the, uh, the this is actually a leveling bar, kind of like the, the, um, the anti-roll bar on your car. It works by applying, the when you press the key down, 
as this bar is being drawn closer to the key, it's also pulling the other side with it. Uh, I meant to say stabilizer bar. That's what it is. It's, it's a stabilizer bar. And all of your double wide or longer keys have it, especially the space bar. So we're going to gently slide it into position. It's actually a good idea to make sure that the nubs aren't busted off the uh, the um, scissor mechanism. Okay, so it's all still there. So what you want to do, let me put the camera down while I explain it so you don't get dizzy. Um, I'm going to just draw that bar in there. It goes into these two little hooks. And then you want to position the key. It looks like on this key it slides better lighting here. Yeah, it has to slide backwards. So you want to push the key slightly beyond the scissor mechanism and then pull it back until it locks into place. Or maybe I'm just overthinking it. Yeah, I'm overthinking it. So there we go. It's problem solved. Wait. So this laptop was actually, um, it was mine, and uh, that was back in 06. Now, I've been at the same job for nine years. Can you believe that? Um, <laughs> started when I was 22, and I'm now 31, so yeah, it's been a while. But as the new guy in summer of 06, the new, per the new one of three people, there were only three people in my department, and I was one of them, I got piece of junk that nobody else wanted so um that having been said really i mean other than the the screen defects it really did work okay it just had that busted hinge and uh, this goes to show that you can use a laptop for many many years with a broken hinge in some cases and this is one of those cases but as soon as that other hinge goes just amazing how well that other hinge actually holds but this has all the typical wear that you're going to find on a G4 um, tie book that you're going to find on eBay or Amazon or wherever else people buy these things. Yard sales, the dump, flea markets, whatever. They're going to have most of these issues. Um, generally, they're going to have cracked bezels. Uh, this is a plastic bezel that goes over the uh, titanium panel. And uh, generally, you're going to find that these are cracked or severely gouged or chunks missing. Um, I had one of these that was in worse condition than this. It had um, just anything that could go wrong had gone wrong. But um, you're going to find that the titanium panels underneath are separating uh, from the framework. And, uh, you know, batteries are going to be, of course but adder than for that and uh, so you know this I can't show you the battery because it has the name of my employer on it but uh, this is um, this may be the original battery to the unit but this is an original one it has a, it, its original configuration was a G4 500 1 meg 256 megs of RAM a 20 gig hard drive 8 megabytes of video and a DVD drive so this was probably the lower end of the model. Actually, I think the lowest had a, had 128 megs of RAM back then. You'll notice it has a copyright date of 2000, whereas this one says 2001. And uh, so this was a newer revision. There's also some differences, by the way, between the two that I want to outline. Let me get this damn latch. This latch, by the way, was a major feat of innovation for the time period. Most PC laptops had two latches, and they were plastic, and they hung down, and I guess someone at Apple said, you know, we don't like that, so we're going to do this. So this is a magnetic latch. I'll show you what I mean. You can use a weak magnet to get it out. This is just a mag uh, fridge magnet, and it should. No, it's not powerful enough. But what's going to happen is a little hook is going to pull out of there. And then once you close the lid all the way, that hook, here we go. I have terrible lighting, I'm sorry. There we go. That hook is going to mate with this latch. 
and it's going to uh, close it. So now, other than that, these weren't terribly unreliable. Um, in fact, we're going to power this one up right now, and we're going to see what it even what it comes up with. Like I said, this is the very last of the Intel's, I mean, excuse me, of the PowerPC laptops to be in service where I work. It's, uh, it was taken out of service and last powered up probably four, maybe even five years ago. So, no, a little later than that, about four years. So, I've got my power saucer hooked up. This is what they shipped with, by the way. Now, these power supplies were common on the, um, the original G3 iBooks, the G4 TieBooks, and I believe the, um, the white iBooks when they first came out. And uh, later on, they redesigned them into the little white brick that we all know and love. Um, these are also shipped off as war, um, recall replacements for the, uh, the Wall Street Power Books. And they come in two flavors. Um, you have the small connector, which is used on the newer machines, and you've got the bigger connector, and I'll compare the two. So if you ever go on eBay and you're looking to buy one of these, yes, there is a difference. Uh, this bigger connector will work, I believe, on the iBooks, and the Wall Streets. The smaller ones are designed for the G4s and the later G3 iBooks. If my memory serves me. Now then again, I have I don't do very much with power PCs anymore. So I'm just recalling that from my own memory banks, which sometimes don't work. So let's turn this sucker on. Nothing. Still nothing. It's plugged in, right? It's not even lighting up. It should be uh it should be lighting up. Let's try this one. Now this one I haven't turned on in ages. Um but I don't see a light on that one either. Uh oh. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so that works. This one hasn't been turned on in a few years. Um, yeah, it's been quite some time. But she is coming to life, waking up from a long slumber. Yes, yes, yes. That one was known to be working when I when it was last uh, was last used. I'll take the battery out. We'll try it again. Sometimes a battery that's dead shorted will prevent the laptop from powering on. So that might be the case. All right, just as I remember it. Cool. And this one is, that one was a 500, this is a, I think it's a 550, yep, it's a 550, and it only has 512 megs of RAM in it right now, because I need to uh, put more memory in it, but I will be doing that. So, while we're here, I mean, I'm jumping all over the place, but I have a lot to cover, and uh, I don't have an outline, so we're going to take a look at the uh, differences between these two versions. Like I said, when you're buying parts for one of these, let's say you have one and you want to bring it back to life again. There's a few things you need to know. The keyboards are not intercompatible. They use a completely different connector. Completely different connector. Um, the motherboards are completely different. Uh, they are not the same at all. In fact, one of the easiest um, observations, this uh, slot, this is an expansion slot for whatever device you may have. It's a PCMCAA slot. And uh, below it is a built-in airport slot um, that is compatible with the original airport card. Um, but there's a cover on the newer version. You can clearly see it also has a picture of smoking bacon on it. See? That's to let you know that you can cook bacon on it. 
So over here, we don't have a cover. Why is that? Who knows? Apple makes a lot of running changes on their designs, and that's just one of many. Um, you can clearly see that the heat piping and heat sink arrangement is different. This one has smoking bacon on the heat sink itself. So you can fry bacon on that too. Uh, this one also features that same exact logo. Not that that matters. Uh, structurally, so this means even the case stiffeners are different. If you look at the arrangement, we have a separate removable piece here that has a magnet that holds the keyboard down. On this one, it's part of the actual assembly. Um, you know, so there's really very few parts that are interchangeable. Even the screens may even be different. Um, now this card here, this is actually the modem, I believe. And, because uh, they were built in on those, back in those days. And modems were generally replaceable. Reason being, um, they were usually the first thing to get hit by lightning. Uh, so, oftentimes, uh, you know, if you're dealing with an electrical storm, <laughs> your modem is usually the first thing to get hit. So, uh, cooling fans, oh, you can actually see the fan right there. It is a completely different fan. The optical drive is completely different. They actually got smaller on this model and are bigger on this one. Actually, no, they might be... No, they are not the same size. They are different. Um, let's see... Yeah, very few parts are intercompatible. Just thought you should... I'm now going to try to power up the other one again. If it doesn't power on, I'm going to rob it from memory. I think I have two 256 meg modules in it. And uh, we're going to pop some of those into this one. Why not, right? Neat little feature. I love these keyboards. They can be easily removed. Oh, yeah, this one had a hard time locking in for some reason. i got to play with that. All right. Does this one still have The Sims installed? Oh, yes, it does. I was using this to play The Sims. Now I'm using my um, uh, my gumdrop uh, with uh, Emac. <laughs> I'm using my Emac for that now. And I'm running, I think this is 10.4. 10.4.11. Runs pretty good on this machine. Too bad the airport's kind of useless. I'm going to have to uh, set up a um, an unsecured network for it. because it's not compatible with the security scheme that I'm using. I believe I'm using WPA, and it's not compatible. Yeah, see. But there's an easy way around that. If you really want to run one of these old machines in your house wirelessly, just set up an old router, set it to um, 802.11b, and uh, strip out Make, you just use Mac filtering. Sometimes uh, that's just the easiest way to get the job done. Uh, Mac address filtering always works on these. Um, of course, Mac addresses can be spoofed, but, you know, take a little risk to get a little benefit, I guess. Okay, I'm going to, uh, once again, try to power this one up. Like I said, I believe it was taken out of working service, and... Uh, Right again. You have no battery in it now, so if there's a parasitic load that's not there anymore. Nothing. Nothing. You'll get nothing. Oh wow. It still smells like these did when they were new. <laughs> I guess that smell never goes away. I remember unboxing these things uh, when I was in high school. Not this model, actually. We were getting the, um, we were just getting in the G3 uh, clamshells and the G3, um, in later years, the other G3s, the white ones. I'll never forget that smell. It, it's like, um, it almost smells like green apple. 
I don't know if that was intentional, but it's it's actually the result of whatever is used in the adhesives in the keyboards plus um, the outgassing of the ABS plastic and uh, all whatever whatever else flux wash things that they were using back then. And in fact, they still kind of have that very same odor to them. It's so prevalent that there was a company that was making um, a perfume or a cologne that was like, you know, Eau to Apple or something like that. Yeah, I can't get anything out of this one. It's just dead. So, I'll just save the keyboard and uh, scrap it. <laughs> it's got a good airport in it, but, you know, maybe I'll pull that out when we get into it. So let's tear it apart, shall we? Everybody loves a good tear apart video, so I'm going to give you one. Find a screwdriver that's suitable. That'll do. And we're just going to start ripping screws out. I'm going to show you how these are actually constructed. And you're going to realize that anyone who thought that the titanium was really structural is just sadly mistaken. Um, because it just isn't. It is not structural. Okay, here we go. I just removed all the screws. And you're going to now see, hopefully, why these laptops were just so poorly made. I mean, they're not poorly made. I don't want to say that. They were just, um, what's Apple's term for poorly made? They're ahead of their time. Oh, shit, it happened. <laughs> it happened. Okay. Did it happen? Yeah. So here's what happens. Because it happened. So you've got your titanium bottom pan, and it's uh, bonded to this um, plastic. Ri uh, it's, it is plastic, but it's a plastic um, mounting structure. What this does, this plastic provides two things. It provides, because um, it's, it's metalized, so it provides some grounding, but and RF shielding, but it also um, actually locks the machine to the base. And the correct way to disassemble it is to pull it back and up. And I think I, I think I pulled up too hard. And uh, I, I, I caused, but I actually kind of wanted to do this to show you how you usually see them when you buy them on eBay. Uh, so this just comes right off because the cement doesn't hold worth a damn. Um, here, let me put the camera down again. You can see just how easily it pulls away in some areas. Just like that. Boom. Done. Now, this happens under normal use. So to find one that doesn't have this problem is pretty freaking rare. Uh, there we go. It just comes right off. You can rebond it. So if you get one of these and it's got this, has already happened, you can always rebond it. Um, it is only plastic. You probably want to use like a Loctite gel super glue, and that would probably get the job done. It is not metal. It is an all plastic, and this is what holds this nice durable piece of titanium to the machine in the front. In the back, it's held in with screws. But this is what the machine looks like from the bottom. It has a massive motherboard by today's standards. And uh, you've got your, your PCMCAA slot card right here, a card slot for the, uh, the airport, which, by the way, was optional. I believe there was a cheaper version of this laptop that did not have Wi-Fi built in. And you actually have to get this wire, antenna wire out of the way, like so. It's not like the, uh, the iBooks where you can just pop it in. One of the reasons the iBooks had an easier to remove airport card is because the airport was in fact an option on most models. So if you bought the iBook without the airport card, Apple encouraged you to add it yourself later on. It was a user, user installable part. So that just pops out like so. For this laptop, this is not a user-serviceable user part. You would have to have bring, brought it to an Apple dealer. It's actually held in by tape. Look at that. 
There we go. Let's get some tape. That's not even Kapton tape. That's Scotch tape. What the hell? Anyway, I'm gonna just, there we go. I have a few of these lying around. So, but you can never have too many of them because they don't make them anymore. Okay. But anyway, so that just, it's actually designed to hinge up a little bit to facilitate easy removal. Now, I don't recall if it was standard equipment on the G4s, or the PowerBook G4s, um, but I know that on the iBook G4s, it was definitely an option. Uh, so, hard drive is removed. Uh, let's see, I think I've got to take... On some models, you actually have to unscrew the drive caddy, but this one doesn't have that. I've actually never pulled a drive out of one of these. You can see it's held in by grommets over here. And I don't think I have to unscrew those. Let's see. The case stiffener. Yeah, I don't know. Fuck it. There we go. That's one way to get it out. Again, we're just going to scrap the machine anyway at this point. Um, but yeah. No, I think the correct way to remove it... Yeah, I don't even know. I don't even know. It's definitely a unique design. This is the original Apple hard drive. Uh, the Apple was using IBM Travel Stars back in those days. And uh, now they're using, I think they're still using Hitachis on the uh, hard drive models. But that's the original 20 gig drive right there. And look at this optical drive. Now this is, um, this is a massive drive. It is uh, one of the biggest I've ever seen. I believe this is the same drive that they were using on the um, at the on the IMAX. So if you swap out the bezel, maybe a few other parts, um, this may bolt right into an iMac. Let's see if I can get that out without making it worse. I believe it comes out from the side here. Oh shit. held in by grommets. Oh, I see what's going on here. Um, yeah. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this tape was holding it down. Maybe I should save this drive. I could probably use it in something. Drive's in good shape. And, uh, Yeah, here, let me see what's in there. Data manufacturer, May of 2001. But yeah, I believe this is a modified version of the drive used in the IMAX. Look at this, it's actually, a, it's belt driven. The, uh, the eject mechanism is in fact belt driven. <laughs> Look at that. Amazing, amazing how much technology has changed. This drive is physically larger, I think, than the one in my ThinkPad uh, 760. Heavy, too. Now, this is actually how you access the, um, the CMOS battery. I believe this is a uh, rechargeable pack. Are they rechargeable? They do look to be rechargeable. Some were, some were not. 3 volt, Panasonic. Let's see this in a minute here. Now that other one is going to definitely need new batteries. Um, but for a pack like this, it doesn't take much to make your own. You can just take a bunch of CR2 or 32s as long as they're not rechargeable. And I don't believe these are. I think these are just standard... Um, the VL2s. That's what it says on the battery. Panasonic VL2. VL23 something. 
I can't see the whole thing. Of course, Apple intended you to buy the entire pack from Apple. So they didn't make the uh, model of the battery itself visible. But it's hard to say which ones are and which ones are not rechargeable, because it's not immediately obvious. And I shouldn't be scraping, scraping it like that, but I can't see the full model on it. But it's a VL2 something. Anyway. Yeah, and there's four of them, and they have to be wired in a specific uh, manner, so. There's three wires, not two. So there must be two different voltages that you're looking for on that. So. So sweet. I don't know why I said so sweet. I just felt like it. Okay, well, that's pretty much it for the teardown. Um, carrying it down any further is going to reveal nothing. I am going to rob it for memory. I think I owe it that much. And uh, even though I think I still have some 256s kicking around elsewhere. But, uh, yeah. Ooh. Come on. There we go. Almost there. I'm not being very careful. Why? Because I don't have to be. So these are both replacement. One is a 128, one's a 256. We're going to forget that ever existed. I have plenty of 128s kicking around. I have no 256s. So. All right. Thank you for watching. And uh, I'm going to go find something else to do. So I was able to find the 512 meg module for this machine. It's now back to its 1 gig status. Um, I wanted to see what size hard drive was in it because I think it has the original drive. So I'm going to do uh, more info on this and see what uh, what brand, make, and model. Uh, yeah, brand and make, that's redundant. What make and model we have. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, this one has an ATA drive, so we're going to look it up and see what's in there. We've got a Fujitsu 20 gig drive. Eh, alright. By the way, I just realized this machine was called Music Box. This is the one that I was using as a um, as a streaming machine from for iTunes for probably about a year or two before I finally retired it. So that explains that. Neat. Battery is currently charging. I've set the date and time. I don't believe the clock battery uh, is still living, so I'm going to have to replace it. Um, or not. Why bother? But I might do it anyway. We fixed the key. We got the memory back. I've cleaned it up a little bit. We're going to kind of resuscitate this machine, bring it back to its uh, formal glory. Formal, former glory. Not former, formal, whatever. You suck. Anyway, uh, it is running quite well, in fact. I've got uh, The Sims still installed. Did I ever install Microsoft Office? I did. It has Office 2004 on it. Look at that. Pretty cool, huh? I don't know why I put that on. But yeah, I was using this as a uh, kind of a music box. That's why I called it Music Box. Clean up my tools. I gotta eat dinner. It's eight o'clock. It's almost nine o'clock. I haven't even eaten dinner yet. I better do that. Better get on that. Get that done. Now I'm just rambling. Thanks for staying with me for this long.